hey, as long as I have all these Powerpuff Girls games handy, how about a bonus video? The Powerpuff Girls Chemical Extraction, published once again by BAM Entertainment. This is a fighting game that was released in 2001, on both the N64 and PlayStation. If you saw my last video on the Powerpuff Girls Game Boy games, you already know not to expect too much, because licensed games like these are designed to make a quick buck from ignorant parents, and nothing more. But somehow, they were even lazier this time, because this is just a reskin of Tom and Jerry Fist of Fury. Er, furry. Which was released a year earlier and developed by the same studio, Viz Entertainment. They didn't even develop a new game. They just gave a game they already made a new coat of paint. And what's worse is, this isn't even the last time they would recycle said game. Tom and Jerry War of the Whiskers on the GameCube and PS2 was just a slightly updated version. Boy, they sure got their mileage out of this one. So we already know that mechanically, this game is going to have nothing to do with the Powerpuff Girls. Because it wasn't built as a Powerpuff Girls game, it was built as a Tom and Jerry game. The most we can hope for at this point is a fighting game with Powerpuff Girls trappings. But whatever, let's look at the N64 version first. Starting it up, you get a jazzed up version of the Powerpuff Girls opening theme, and a menu where you get to pick between a solo campaign and a two player versus mode, or no, I'm sorry, simulator mode. If you try and dive right into simulator mode, you'll notice that you don't have most of the characters and stages unlocked right away. To get them, you gotta complete the campaign. Unlockables are the easiest way to give a game like this a sense of progression, so I don't mind that too much. It at least gives you some incentive to actually finish the game. So alright, let's try the story mode first. In lieu of a cutscene explaining what's going on, we get these black slides with white text on them. Man, they really spared no expense here, did they? They used the Powerpuff Girls font, so they give them points for at least being thorough with the Powerpuff Girls paint job, but it's actually really difficult to read. At the Utonium Chateau, the girls are... ooing? Ruing? Together, their own mix of sugar, spice, and... Oh, it's adding. They were adding them together. The O's and D's look identical. So the story is the girls are baking a pie and decide, like idiots, to put Chemical X in it, because nothing bad could ever come of that. And then Mojo steals the pie, so now all the villains also have superpowers, and the girls have to go fight them all and beat it all back out of them. It seems kind of unnecessary, don't you think? I mean, the villains haven't technically done anything wrong yet. They just have access to superpowers now. I mean, yeah, they could be potentially more dangerous if they decide to do something evil, but the Powerpuff Girls are supposed to be on the side of justice. Whatever happened to innocent until proven guilty? Well, anyway, it seems like each girl gets their own separate campaign according to these numbers over here. So let's just start with Bubbles and get this thing over with. The first fight is against Billy in the mayor's office. It's a 3D fighter, and you're not locked to a 2D perspective or anything, so it's basically a free-for-all. The general idea is that you don't want the opponent to have all the chemical X because it makes your attacks incrementally stronger the more you have, so you want to toss objects at them to knock it out of them. Man, what is it with these Powerpuff Girls games and their fixation on making Chemical X a thing? It feels like the only reason they bothered including a story at all was to drop a lampshade on it. Because again, in the show, Chemical X doesn't work that way, so forcing it as a mechanic otherwise is just confusing. You have a few different attacks, a punch, a kick, you can fly around and do like a homing attack, and if you press A and Z together you kind of like explode a little bit. There's also a block button, but it does literally nothing. All Billy can do is throw stuff and punch, so as long as he doesn't catch you off guard or trap you in the corner, he can't really do much to you. If you just keep mashing buttons, you can corner him and kill him without any problem. There's really not a lot of strategy involved. Just flail your hand around on the controller and eventually you'll win. The second fight is against Sedusa at the bank. So much like the Game Boy games, they do at least get some details right. You fight the villains in roughly the same place that the girls fight them in the show at one point or another. The game looks pretty good too. I mean, all early 3D games look a little rough, but it smiles better than the Game Boy Color one in terms of decent looking textures, and it manages to retain the style from the show fairly well. There isn't much differentiating Sedusa from Billy except that Wicked do, since they play just the same. And even if the stage looks different, the layout is more or less the same as the mayor's office too. Actually, come to think of it, even the music is the same. It's the same music that's on the title screen, too. Is there only one song in this whole game? It just starts over and over again every round. And if you think that's annoying, the sound effects are even worse. They're loud, repetitive, and overpowering, and even if your attack gets blocked, the full sound gets played anyway. Next up is Princess at Pokeoaks Kindergarten. Once again, there's no difference between her and the other two. She's just a smaller target. So at this point, I'm beginning to work out my winning strategy, Relentless Explosion Spam. I didn't realize how overpowered this move was at first, but it's basically pressing the win button. There's no limit on how often you can do it, and doesn't require chemical X or anything. It's hard to miss with it because it homes in on them a little, it does an insane amount of damage, and it causes them to drop health packs. So there's really no reason to use any other attack or even try to fight fair. 
It's completely broken, and matches are over in a matter of seconds. Now I've unlocked the next stage, Fuzzy Lumpkin's Cabin. Oh, I guess there are stage hazards here for the first time. Well, it's nice to see something at least a little different after three stages. Wait, I'm stuck? I really can't move! I'm stuck on the fire! I'm not sure whether to blame that one on bad level design, or the ridiculous recoil in this game. It seems to affect you and the opponent equally, so at least you can both abuse it, but once you get hit a few times, you basically get locked into an endless flinch, and it's hard to get away. What? How'd I do that? I guess that's what all the chemical X is really for. If you get all three, you can use your laser vision. That's neat and all, but clearly not necessary considering I haven't needed to use it once to get to this point, and it doesn't even do very much damage. It seems like a better idea is just to hang on to your chemical X so that regular attacks do more damage and keep spamming explosion. Man, this game is so balanced, you guys. The final stage is the Volcano Observatory- oh, nope, it's over already. Alright, that's Bubbles in the Bag. That was surprisingly easy. Let's see what Blossom's story is like. No! You're kidding me! Are you serious? It's the exact same thing! It's the same five stages in the same order, unchanged. What's the point? Why make you do the same five boring easy fights three times in a row? They don't even shuffle the stages and villains around. I think maybe it gets harder, but so much of this game is just button mashing it's hard to even tell. The girls don't even play differently from each other. They all have the exact same moves, so literally nothing is different. I mean, there's padding the game out, and then there's packing it full of thermal insulation with pillows tied to your hands. I guess this might be nice for a family of three, so each kid would get to play the full game for themselves, but the game doesn't save data anyway, it uses a password system. So you could easily have them all played on their own anyway, and to unlock all the stages and villains, you have to play through the whole thing three times. It's not optional. So not only is the game itself recycled, but it even recycles its own content. How much more lazy can you get? Like I said earlier, unlockables can give you more incentive to finish the game, but they shouldn't be your only incentive. The game itself should be at least a little fun and not a boring, redundant, unbalanced mess. The silver lining, if you can call it that, is that the game is at least stupidly short as long as you keep spamming your explosive attack. Each girl only takes 10 minutes to complete, so the whole game is only a half hour long. But oh boy, am I getting really tired of hearing that theme song at this point. God, it just never stops! Once you beat the five stages with all three girls, you finally get to unlock the final stage where you fight him. I will say him looks genuinely terrifying even as a polygon, but he's not any harder to fight. The end. So now that you have all the stages and characters unlocked, you can go duke it out in two-player mode if you can somehow rope a friend into playing this with you. Weird thing though is that only one player can choose a Powerpuff Girl. Both players can be villains, but only one can be a hero, which is odd, especially when you consider how overpowered the girl's special explosion attack is. Fortunately, in versus mode, some of the villains can also fly, and they have access to the explosion move too, so it's slightly more balanced than story mode. But most kids wouldn't want to play as a villain, right? The nice thing about the Powerpuff Girls to begin with compared to most superhero franchises is that you have three leads, so you and your friends can all be your favorite one. But here they force you to play as a bad guy anyway. That doesn't seem fair. It's not like the game works too hard to make sense in the Powerpuff Girls universe as it is. It wouldn't be that weird to have the girls fighting each other compared to anything else in this game. All the Powerpuff Girls games we've seen so far really fail to do anything interesting with the three of them as a team, and that's pretty disappointing. Here they can't even appear on screen together. Now, ordinarily, I would assume that the N64 and PlayStation versions of these games were more or less the same, but for some reason the critic scores I could find for these games varied somewhat, with the N64 version coming out worse for wear. So out of curiosity, let's check out the PlayStation version to see if there's any difference. And the forces of evil. Well, right off the bat, this one is miles ahead in presentation. It actually has cutscenes, and they don't even look that bad. Though, I mean, it is a game from 2001, it does still look bad. They do at least explain the story a little bit better this time. Apparently it was just Bubbles that thought putting Chemical X in the pie was a good idea, it's fully voice acted, and even though the campaign is the same this time around, the music is actually different on every stage! It feels like they also made an effort to balance the game this time too. First of all, they took away the cheap explosion move. It's totally gone. All you have this time is punches, kicks, and a flying kick, 
which is more or less what all the enemies can do too, since some of the enemies can actually fly in the story mode in this game. This means the playing field is much more level, and there's more incentive to actually use the chem collects you collect for your special move. But now that you actually have to try to play well in order to win, the bad control becomes glaringly obvious. Every input seems to be delayed about half a second, which is some pretty bad button lag. And like most PS1 games, the movement is totally awkward. Almost every game on the PlayStation is designed to be played with a D-pad, because they didn't add analog sticks to the controller until later in the console's lifespan. So you have to try and navigate a 3D stage with movement that's tied to a grid. If you have a controller with analog sticks, you can try to play using them instead, but it feels weird and imprecise, like trying to drive with your knees. Nothing in this version locks onto your opponent, so you have to try to manually aim all of your attacks, and it gets incredibly hard to hit anything. Between the button lag, the bad movement, ineffective blocking, and that out-of-control recoil, in a lot of fights, it can be hard to even damage your opponent. They're all bigger than you and have a longer range, so trying to get on their level and actually punch them before they hit you is almost impossible. I find myself mashing buttons even more frantically this time, in the vain hope that I'll hit anything. My thumb honestly hurts from playing this. The only move that locks on at all is your Chemical X special, so you really need to be on your game and get all the Chemical X. But even collecting it this time around is a nightmare. It bounces away from you and it gets knocked out of you. So you have to go running after it with your terrible controls, all the while trying not to get stuck on objects from the stage. And that gives the opponent lots of time to throw more crap at you and knock it all back out of you again. This version is actually really challenging, and not in a terribly consistent way. The first few fights, Billy, Sidious, and Fuzzy are all easy again, because they have pretty bad AI and they're big targets, so it's easier to aim your flying kick at them. When you're in the air, they can't really hurt you, so even if it's not as cheap as the explosion was, it's still your best bet. But Princess actually flies this time too, and a lot of the time, she won't come down at all. There's nothing you can do when she's in the air but wait for her to come back down. You can't even hit her with the Chemical X move, so you just have to wait for her to stop screwing around up there and come down and fight you. It's not necessarily hard to beat her, but it takes freaking forever. Can you just get the f down here already? Ace and Mojo have an AI all their own, though. If you don't get all the Chemical X right at the start of the match, you're screwed, because they can and will aggressively go after it and murder you. Most of the other villains stop throwing stuff at you once you don't have any Chemical X left, since it doesn't do a lot of damage and just stuns you. But these two never stop! Like, jeez, can you leave me alone for five freaking- Huh. Mojo is the absolute worst though, because he also flies, so there's just no way to hit him and stop him from getting all the Chemical X. So here's what you do. This is the only way it worked out to beat him. As soon as the match starts, run to the right and throw the first two objects in your path at him, and collect the Chemical X that falls out of him. A third Chemical X will spawn in the back of the room a few seconds later, so grab that and slam him with your laser vision as fast as possible. Then once he's weakened, it's hard for him to come back from that. So as long as he doesn't get all the Chemical X back, you can just spam flying kicks or whatever until you win. You still have to play through the entire game three times, which is pretty ridiculous. But at least there are extra unlockables in this version compared to the N64 one. Once you clear the five stages with one girl, you unlock a second special attack that only they can use. So now there's something to differentiate the three in versus mode. And there are two new unlockable stages that aren't in the story mode this time. The Jail and the Utonium Chateau. What's weird is these stages still appear on the menu for the N64 version too, but they're not actually selectable or in the game. Only on the PlayStation. For whatever reason, you can still only have one player be a Powerpuff Girl, but at least since the cheap move is gone now, the special moves matter more, and there's more incentive to play as some of the stronger villains, like him and Mojo. So there you go, the Powerpuff Girls Chemical Extraction. If you must play it, play the PlayStation version, but really, even the Game Boy games are better than this, so my advice is don't. There are other Powerpuff Girls games out there, and some of them might even be good, and maybe someday we'll come back and take a look at a few more of them. But hey, since this is a bonus video and we have time to think too hard about shovelware, let's take a minute to go back to licensed games as a concept, shall we? The problem with licensed games like these, of course, is that they're generally bad. And their badness is baked in by design. By the business model that creates them, it doesn't make financial sense to waste money on quality when the main selling point is the name. Your parents don't need to know the review scores of a game to know it's something you might be interested in. All they need to know is what cartoons or toys or movies you already like. But it always amused me that a lot of the games that go down in history as the worst of all time are licensed. Why is that? Why are we as a collective still so angry about these games? How can we be upset that a game that doesn't try to entertain us doesn't succeed? Why aren't we reserving this hate for a title that actually had a potential and just squandered it? 
For a long time, I figured their notoriety was an issue of expectations, that people wrongly assume that because the property it's based on is good, that the game should be too. And those expectations are shattered when what they get is a barely playable mess. Or maybe they were just mad that they were duped into buying a bad game to begin with by this lazy marketing strategy. But I think now, the reason these games stick in people's minds has more to do with how successful this strategy was. Everyone I know had at least one of these licensed games growing up. And back then, in the days before smartphones and YouTube, you would only have a handful of games to occupy your time. We were stuck playing this garbage, so we remember it. We remember wasting hours of our lives on crap like Chemical Extraction or Superman 64. Most of all, we remember how angry and frustrated they made us. Without a frame of reference, maybe some of us actually enjoyed these games. But even if they were just budget garbage games that most people get a laugh out of now, I think they did some harm, too. For a lot of people, these were the first video games they ever played, especially if you were outside the usual game-buying demographic and were shut off from the rest of the market. Though brand name recognition may have been a good way to get games in the hands of people who might not otherwise play them, how many of those kids stuck around after their first impression of a video game was this? How many kids made it out of the bad game ghetto and transitioned into the core game-buying market? I know most of my friends didn't. Fortunately, this trend has died off in recent years, and isn't the problem it used to be, thanks to the rise in development costs of video games rendering this licensing strategy obsolete. But I'm pretty lucky that Pokemon was a game before it ever was a TV show, because otherwise, as far as my parents were concerned, Pokemon Red was just another game based on something their kid liked. If it wasn't the only good game I owned back then, I might not even be here right now. Come to think of it, what was the first game I ever owned that was developed by a major studio, and not something I had prior interest in as a franchise? Thanks for watching, everybody! If you liked what you saw, go ahead and leave me a thumbs up, and check out the cards on your screen for more videos by yours truly. And of course, if you want to be notified when I post new videos, click that big ol' subscribe button. I'll be uploading a new video every other week, and I stream every Saturday and Sunday over on my Twitch channel if you just can't get enough in between. That's all for today, but I'll be back again soon with more videos. See ya!